Hi, this is Chase Thompson, pastor of First Baptist Church of Central City, and we are so glad that you are streaming this sermon today. We provide these sermons online so that you can have the opportunity to hear and be reminded of God's Word at any time. We also hope these sermons will provide an opportunity for you to share the message of Jesus with others. Basically, we hope these sermons will build you up and lead others to know Jesus. That being the case, please know that our prayer for you is that you would be plugged in and involved in a local church. God calls us to be a part of a local body of believers under the care and leadership of local pastors. These sermons cannot replace that. So if you don't have a church home, we would invite you to come and be with us at any time at First Baptist Church of Central City. We would love to have you. And thank you again for tuning in. May the Lord be with you. Thank you, Eleni. As I, as I mentioned, it's uh, good to be back with you. We were on vacation this week. I told them on Wednesday night, for those of you keeping score, I did not get in the water. I told you I wouldn't last week, and I kept my word. I didn't get in the water. Uh, however, I know that our uh, sack lunch ministry concluded over the past couple weeks, and always appreciative of those who are so faithful to serve, those who would put those sack lunches together on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights, and those who would make those deliveries on Mondays and Thursdays. I do want to say, I think this year we had our two youngest ever servants who went out on sack lunch deliveries, sack lunch deliveries. Of course, Alexis Scott, Damian Gardner, we all stand just for a brief second here. Uh, these two went out and served with our sack lunch team. Amen. Y'all go ahead and be seated. You can be seated. Uh, you know, our, our sack lunch team that does that so faithful, James Duke, so many others uh, who do that so faithfully every year. I don't want to leave any of them out, but I'm just so thankful for two young folks who would get involved in such a way. And I think it's encouragement to all of us that we can step up and help those who've been serving for years and years and carrying some of that load as well. There is always a place for us to serve at First Baptist Church of Central City. So if you're looking for a way you can get plugged in and serve in the Lord, you feel free to let us know and we will find a place for you. Thank you all, and thanks to all those who have served so faithfully on that sack lunch team throughout these past many years. Uh, it's amazing as we uh, look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Uh, it's amazing when you talk with people today and get into spiritual conversations with people, uh, the common ground that so many of us have, because as you will talk with folks, even non-Christian people, uh, they will almost immediately say something like, well, you know, the world we live in is getting pretty crazy. Right? Or they'll say, I just can't believe the stuff that's out there today. And let me tell you, they're not wrong. Okay? They're not wrong. Uh, you and I both know there is some crazy stuff going on. I don't know if you saw this, uh, some headlines recently, but very recently, uh, some public libraries, public libraries uh, have introduced something called Drag Queen Story Time. Uh, this is where drag queens come in and they read books to children as young as preschool age. Uh, last week, there was a video that went viral online. Uh, I thought about showing you this, but we have children here. And so decided that I couldn't, in good conscience, show you this video. Uh, but there's a video of a drag queen teaching four- and five-year-olds in one of these public libraries how to twerk. How to twerk. Uh, the liberal Louisville Courier-Journal, writing positively in May 2019 about one of these drag queen story time events in Louisville, Louisville, two hours away, uh, said this. Quote, uh, Vanessa Demornay led the library's first drag queen story time. Outside, the American Family Association of Kentucky held a prayer vigil in opposition to the event, but were outnumbered by those who came to support the event and cheer on the families who walked into the library. Again, this is Louisville. Demornay, whose real name is Mikhail Schultz, wasn't worried about those outside protesting and stressed the importance of the event. Quote, the biggest message for me was the same message I wish I had gotten as a kid, which is exactly what we shared with kids today, De Mornay said. It's not how you want to dress or what you put on your body that determines who you are. I just wish I had had that eye-opening experience of meeting someone so different and knowing that it is okay and acceptable, end quote. De Mornay, the article goes on, read two books during the Drag Queen story time, My Princess Boy, about a boy who likes to dress up and be himself, the other, not all princesses dress in pink, included lines that princesses can wear athletic cleats or wear jewels while using power tools. End of article. Folks, understand if the world around us can normalize sin for your children, then they win. They win. And so that's the goal, right? Get them early and raise them up in the way that they should not go. 
This is why you see school curricula across the country being changed to include LGBTQ language. It's why on May 13th of this year, PBS, Public Broadcasting, depicted a gay wedding in a positive light on the children's program, Arthur, a show that many of us watched when we were children. Understand, they're coming for your kids. And when we live in a world like the one we live in today, we we really have to ask, is all of this really just out of the blue? Are we living in a specifically crazy time, unlike anything else that could ever be expected? Or should this be expected? And is there a way for us to respond? We look now to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Scripture says, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Time out. Now the world reads that passage, those last couple verses, and says that's misogynistic. Okay, Paul was a misogynist. But understand, this is the same Paul who wrote in Galatians, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And recognize today that if it were not for Christianity, and specifically the things that God said through Paul, Western civilizations today would likely be like some of these Muslim and pagan civilizations where women are not allowed to be heard, not allowed to be seen, not allowed to vote, and not allowed to drive. So just a kind of quick tip, if you're reading through one of Paul's letters, ladies, you feel free to pull out your driver's license and thank Paul for being so faithful to God's word. So all of that being explained, what's really going on here? And when you read this passage in context, and you understand it in context, you realize that these men and women lived in a non-Christian society, one in which Christianity was brand new. Uh, The world in which they lived was very hostile to Christianity, and Christians had no social influence. And in this non-Christian utopia that so many people want to get back to today, women were neither respected nor educated. And what was happening specifically in Timothy's context is these false teachers, these Gnostics, they were going around and they were converting these uneducated women, specifically young widows. And they were then encouraging them to seize the pulpit and to preach Gnosticism. This explains Paul's words here, as well as Paul's instructions for Timothy in 1 Timothy. It all makes sense in context. Paul was no misogynist. Verse 8. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men of depraved mind rejected in regard to the faith. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all just as Janus's and Jambres' folly was also. Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions and sufferings such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Pray with me.
Almighty God, we need your word today. Lord, I pray that you would help me not to be a distraction. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be focused today. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see. Lord, soften our hearts to be able to receive your word and to be changed by it. God, we come to you today seeking for you to speak to us. Lord, your people need fresh bread. So, God, we ask that you would speak to us and by your Holy Spirit that you would convict us and fashion us and make us more like Christ. Use us for your glory, we pray. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. In verse 1, the Apostle Paul writes, But realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come. And notice there in verse 1, the scripture doesn't say difficult times might come. It doesn't say the difficult times could come. It says the difficult times will come. And it says they will come in the last days. Now, before you think I'm up here spouting doomsday warnings, okay, understand. When you read about the last days in the Bible, that's the time period that began when Christ had ascended and sent his Holy Spirit to his believers And it will last until he comes again in judgment. So Paul and Timothy biblically lived in the last days. And likewise today, we are living in the last days. That being said, we need to recognize that difficult times will come. And indeed, difficult times have come. But we should not be shocked by this. We should not be surprised by this. And ironically, we should not be discouraged by this because it is no surprise to the Lord. And guess what? He's still in control. Now, we read that big long list that begins in verse 2. 18, 18 vices that make life difficult for us and also for those who practice them. And it's obvious that these are all things that we still see today. But you know where it all starts? Look again at verse 2. It says, for men will be lovers of, say it with me, self. Lovers of self. Understand, brothers and sisters, that's the message of our culture today. Love yourself. Trust yourself. Be yourself. Follow your heart. Not Jesus, your heart. Be who you were born to be. Don't let anybody ever change you. Church, can I just say that you and I were born entirely in our sins? And if we don't repent and receive a total change from the Lord, we are destined for destruction? That's the truth. That's who we are. We were born sinners. And when we decide in life to embrace that and to love that, then we set ourselves on a course for eternal destruction because that's what sinners deserve to receive. Sinners like me, sinners like you, that's who we were born to be. Again, the Bible says, verse 2, verse 2. Pay close attention here to everything that's listed. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, Boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power and look what it says at the end of verse 5 avoid such men as these first corinthians 15 33 says do not be deceived bad company corrupts good morals brothers and sisters make no mistake when we read that list of 18 vices that list isn't describing christian people so if that list describes you or me today we need to repent We need to get right with God because that's not the fruit of a Holy Spirit-filled walk with Christ. That's the fruit of Antichrist. And the best way to handle these types of people, it says in verse 5, is to avoid them. Avoid them. 
The real call there is to avoid their influence. Avoid the corruption that they bring to the truth. Have nothing to do with it. Brothers and sisters, here's the deal. And this keeps coming up in 2 Timothy, which would tempt us to say, well, we'll just move on past it. We've already heard it. But really, we need to hear it again. We need to listen more to it. But the things we watch, the stuff we read, the music we listen to, the podcasts we subscribe to, the Facebook and Twitter and Instagram accounts that we follow, the websites we visit, basically everything that you let take up residence in your mind affects you and it affects me here in second timothy is talking about false teachers and their false teachings that still holds true today okay that's still a danger for us today but i think in our generation in our location and in our culture we are far more in danger of being drawn into sin by the education and me or excuse me entertainment and media of our day Because what happens is, sin gets normalized through entertainment and media. This is why those controversial television shows that came out about 20 years ago, you look back and you say, well, that's pretty tame. It's pretty tame. Because today it is tame by our standards. Because the more perverse things get, the less we think about it. That's how our culture works. I'll give you an example. Show of hands, how many of you have watched and enjoyed I Love Lucy? Raise your hand if you like I Love Lucy. Look at all the hands around here. Lots of hands going up. Okay, you can put your hands down. Yeah, I Love Lucy. That show aired from 1951 to 1957 originally. Of course, there's reruns. It was on CBS. But CBS, when that show was popular, made Ricky and Lucy, who were husband and wife on the show and husband and wife in real life, made them sleep in two separate twin beds on the show okay on the show they also didn't want them to ever talk about lucy being pregnant when she was pregnant she was either expecting or she was in the family way how many of you remember that from tv someone being in the family way yeah she was expecting she was in the family way because they didn't even want to hint they thought it was inappropriate to even hint about sex between this married couple on a live television not live but a broadcasted television show now you take another comedy this is a favorite of mine. It's a favorite of Brother Kevin, too, because we'll talk about it and quote it from time to time. How many of you have seen Seinfeld? Seinfeld, yeah, show your hands. Be proud, you Seinfeld fans. It's a funny show, right? Yeah, Seinfeld. Seinfeld aired from 1989 to 1998. Okay, so long after I Love Lucy. Just about every single episode of Seinfeld involved either one or all of the four main characters having premarital sex with a brand new sexual partner. Now, I watched that as a child growing up, and I never once thought, you know, that's wrong. That's wrong. I I never once had that thought. It, It was normal. It happened on every single episode. And to my shame, when I watch it now, I still don't cringe, okay? That still never comes to my mind. I still just ignore it, even though it's wrong. I just watch and laugh. It's funny. You see, because it's portrayed in a comedic way, you dismiss it. Oh, it's just a funny show. And when things are funny to us, I mean, any psychologist will tell you, it goes through your filter. right? You have a filter, it slips through when it's funny, and it changes your way of thinking. The Office is a huge, I mean, if you like The Office, go ahead. I like The Office, love The Office. Hugely popular show, ran from 05 to 2013. It is still the number one streaming show on Netflix today. Uh, if you all are aware, you're about to start paying a lot more money for the shows you like and the movies you like because all these other streaming services are getting started. And Comcast is going to be taking the office off of Netflix pretty soon and using it on theirs because they own it. So Netflix is concerned it's their number one show. But on The Office, very popular show, there was a character named Oscar. Right? And Oscar is an insignificant side character at first. You, you don't really see him a lot. But you come to expect to see him, and you like Oscar. Oscar's a funny guy. Oscar's very mature. He's very intelligent. And then towards the very end of season two, without any kind of prior mention, they bring up the fact that Oscar is a gay man. 
And you think to yourself, well, it's okay. I, I like the office, right? Oscar's just character here. I, I know what they're doing. They're kind of pushing an agenda, but it's no big deal. And then a few seasons later, he's dating on the show. And a few seasons later, he's kissing a man on the show. And yet we become used to it, and so we kind of brush it off, say, well, Oscar's a funny guy. I like Oscar. You know, maybe this just isn't that big of a deal. Maybe it's not that big of a deal. And pretty soon, all shows, because it worked for The Office, include a main character like Oscar. See, this is the way sin creeps in, and it affects our culture, and it affects us. And more importantly, it's the way that sin has such a huge impact on our kids. Because you and I might be able to watch The Office with no problem, and we may say to ourselves, it doesn't bother me, I can kind of filter that through, I know exactly what's going on, I know what they're doing. But when our kids see us laughing at that and approving of that, they can't have those complex thoughts. They just know mom and dad are okay with it. Understand, we're called to avoid such influence. Now, I'm not saying that we need to get a dumpster and go dump all of our televisions out in the dumpster and shield ourselves from everything and totally take up a Puritan way of life and just bury our heads in the sand. I'm not saying that. Maybe I should say that, but I'm not saying that. But we cannot be ignorant of the way that things affect us. We can't be ignorant of it. And understand, for the people that put the filth out there, it's all about, say it with me, the money. It's about the money. Verse 2 says, they are lovers of money. Here's a recent example for you. Uh, Victoria's Secret. I won't ask you to raise any hands about Victoria's Secret. Victoria's Secret for years, for years and years and years, has been a very successful company. How did they get so successful? They sold sex. Okay? They immorally objectified women to sell a product. And it worked. It worked just fine. Nobody had a problem with it until 2017. 2017... Something called the Me Too movement takes off and Victoria's Secret takes a big hit because now people are calling it sexist and degrading to women. And guess what? Newsflash, it is. It is sexist and it is degrading to women. But now it's getting called out for it. Then after that, the timeline gets worse for them, past comments come up from their chief marketing officer. Comes to light where in the past he had said that the company would never hire a transgender model, which was a perfectly reasonable thing to say five years ago. Can't say that anymore. But he had said that and that comes to light. And so now they have even more public pressure on them. People want this guy's job. They want him fired. Well, then, just the past couple of weeks, understand, the New York Times puts out an article that details the company's connection, Victoria's Secret, details their connection to the recently deceased child rapist, Jeffrey Epstein. Now you've got a huge problem. So the company is rapidly falling out of favor with the public, which means they are losing, again, money. They're losing money. They need good PR, folks. They need a headline. They've got to bounce back. They've got to have something to turn this around. They need positive buzz. So what do they do? Well, they very quietly fired that chief marketing officer, and they hired their first ever, very publicly, transgender model. And now everybody on the left's happy again as sin becomes more and more normalized. Now again, understand... Victoria's Secret is no bastion of morality. Okay? It was never anything more than a company that made money off the objectification of daughters and sisters. But once that stopped working, they jumped on the newest and trendiest sin that would keep them rolling toward the big bucks. Folks, don't be ignorant. Look again at verses 6 through 9. Verse 6. 
We explain the context of this, but for among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and John were supposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth. Men of depraved mind, rejected in regard to the faith, but they will not make further progress for their folly will be obvious to all, just as Janice's and Jambres' folly was also. These women who lived in a non-Christian society that did not educate them, did not value them, were being taken advantage of by these Gnostic teachers, and they were being used to infiltrate the church because they were ignorant of the truth. The message for all of us today, women and men, is do not be ignorant of what you let inside your household. Don't be captivated by these purveyors of perversion. In Paul's context, it was the women who were falling into this stuff, but today I would just say this, men, you don't know how much your sons look up to you. No matter how young they are, or if they're teenagers, no matter how rebellious they are, you don't realize that they want to be just like you. Just like you. Every man can acknowledge this about his own father. You wanted to be just like the man. And so that's how they are going to turn out. And you also don't realize how much you set the example for your daughters of what a man should be. What are you tacitly approving of? What kind of example are you setting for your family in following Christ? What are you letting into your home? Look again at verse 10. Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions and suffering such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Paul had been like a father to Timothy. And Timothy had seen Paul's teaching and conduct and purpose and faith and patience and love and perseverance and persecutions and sufferings. Paul had shown Timothy how a believer in Jesus follows Jesus. And he'd shown him at the end of verse 11 how the Lord was faithful in all circumstances. And he acknowledges to Timothy that the path of following Jesus is a very difficult path. Look at verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being persecuted deceived paul says it's going to be a tough road you are going to face opposition but it's worth every minute of it hey i can tell you i lost friends when i started following jesus i lost some relationships with some folks when i became a christian back in high school and following jesus has caused some difficult times, some difficult moments for me. But you know what? I wouldn't trade it for anything. Knowing Jesus is better. Following Jesus is better. Being with Jesus is far better than anything else in this world. How's that song go? I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be, be led by His nail-pierced hand. Sing it with me. Than to be the king of a vast domain. Or be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world 
affords today. Knowing Jesus is better. Being with Jesus is better. Therefore, we must continue in following him. One more time, look with me. Verse 14. He says, you, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Parents, your children ought to see you following Jesus. They ought to see you reading your Bible. You ought to read your Bible with them. Your home ought to be a place where Jesus is worshipped and revered the way Jesus deserves to be worshipped and revered. And for, quite frankly, we ought to hate the things that mock Him. We ought to hate the sins, never the sinners. Never the sinners. Jesus came to save sinners like us. But we ought to hate the sins that would consume our children. We ought to hate the ideologies that would set up self above Savior. Timothy knew the sacred writings. Here they are. Look up here. Here's the sacred writings. Timothy knew these sacred writings from childhood because his mother and his grandmother loved Jesus, even when his deadbeat dad wasn't in the picture. We need parents like that today. Children need parents like that today. Because one more time, verse 15, what he says, from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom of that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Folks, God has given us his word so that we could know the truth. And when we know the truth, sin won't shock us or surprise us. We won't be ignorant of Satan's influence in our world and in our lives. And we will come to the faith that leads to salvation, faith, in Jesus Christ. Friends, we need to stick with the Bible as our foundation for truth. We need to believe the Bible above anything and everything else because the Bible tells us about a Savior. The Savior who came in our place and lived the perfect life that we couldn't live. The Savior who suffered and died a sinner's death in our place to pay the price you and I couldn't pay. The Savior who rose from the dead and overcame the grave in our place that anyone who would turn to Him would have eternal life. And the Bible calls us to respond to Jesus by turning from our sins and believing on Him. And it says everyone who put their faith in Jesus will be saved. And folks understand that is even the worst, the worst of sinners. That's called the gospel. That's called the good news. And that's the message the world needs today. It's the message you and I have always needed. It's the message your neighbor needs. It's the message your kids need. It's the message your nieces and nephews and grandkids need. They need it. We need it. Because our sin has separated us from God. But God came down to build a bridge back to himself through the cross and resurrection of Jesus that we might all be saved by turning from sin and trusting in him for our salvation. Pray with me.